Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Tim Nelson, uh, EO4 EG07 in civil engineering, and co chair of this year's Lead It Planning Committee. I've been a volunteer since 2007 and have served as the president of Tufts Alumni San Francisco and as chair of the Alumni Council's Regional Programs Committee. I'm very excited to be here today. A key component of the Tufts University Alumni Association strategic plan is to increase the diversity of involved alumni across all schools and to facilitate meaningful interactions among all alumni constituencies. To that end, we're pleased to offer a professional development session on a related topic this morning. <clears throat> If asked, uh, most people would probably say that they treat others fairly, that they don't judge people based on their race or their gender. Yet many of us have probably had the experience of being told by someone that our actions or the actions of our organizations were biased. So today we have two Tufts professors who are going to discuss the science of stereotyping and implicit bias. They're going to address some of the challenges that you can face in your personal and professional lives and what strategies you should consider to best mitigate their impact. Joining us today is Dr. Keith Maddox, an associate professor in the Department of Psychology and director of the Tufts University Social Cognition Lab, and also Dr. Samuel Summers, a professor in the Department of Psychology. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Okay, um, good morning. Uh, thanks for, for having us. Uh, my name is Sam Summers. Uh, this is Keith Maddox. We're going to do a little tag team exercise here uh, with you this morning. And what our, our hope is to do here is we'll give you a little sense of what, uh, a reminder of what it was like to be a student at Tufts uh, and uh, talk a little bit about the science behind issues related to bias and stereotyping and how those issues um, might play out in the kinds of various backgrounds and industries and professions that everyone here represents. The idea here is to start a bit of a conversation that maybe you can bring back to your organization or to give you a flavor for the ways in which scientists can approach these issues that do affect a wide swath of different organizations and institutions in very different ways. And so we are used to, uh, as some of you may recall, because I actually see some familiar faces that I've had in class before sitting out there, um, but uh, as, uh, as, as you know, we're used to, to teaching, to giving lectures at 10.30 in the morning to 18 and 19 year olds, which if you do the circadian rhythm conversion is like, for the rest of us as humans, it's like 2.30 in the morning. It's very, very early to them. And so we are very used to uh, starting and doing uh, uh, audience participation exercises. So we're going to ask you to help us out with something today for a variety of reasons, because one, I think it makes compelling um, some of the issues, and makes very real and, and accessible some of the issues we want to discuss, but also because um, it helps wake people up. So uh, here's what we're going to do, a little exercise. It's a categorization task. And if you were seated in a computer terminal in a cubicle in the psych department at 490 Boston Avenue uh, in one of our research studies, there'd be a little keypad in front of you that would measure your response time within milliseconds of precision. Now, we're not going to do that today. What I'm going to ask instead is I'm going to ask you to do a categorization task or a series of them by slapping your own legs. Left hand on left leg, right hand on right leg. So you can go ahead and, and assume that position if you would. Put your coffee down, put your notes down, uh, your phone away, and so forth. One of the tasks I'm going to ask you to do is to categorize, uh, classify words as being pleasant or unpleasant words. I don't want you to memorize this list, but I do want you to take a look to see that this is a representative list of pleasant words. Now, Again, these won't be the words you see. These are just representative. And so these are the pleasant words, and these are some examples of unpleasant words. You may have idiosyncratic responses to some of these individual words. That's not really the point. You may have just gone on a family vacation that was a nightmare, uh, and, and, and you see it here on the pleasant list, but that's, not, that's beside the point. You can recognize that these are consensus pleasant words, and these are consensus unpleasant words, and that's one task. Your other task is going to be to classify names and specifically to classify names as being, again, by consensus, either black-sounding or white-sounding names. So for example, I show you this list of names as a, a list of stereotypically black names and this list as a list of stereotypically white names. Now again, you may very well be black and not have one of these names. You may have one of these names and not be black. My guess is we have a lot of people in this room who are white who don't have these names, and we have people who have these names in this room and are not white. I'm not suggesting that you were named wrong. I'm simply... <laughs> asking you to make judgments based on consensus of black-sounding names and white-sounding names. And that's it. That's the task. 
Now, your instructions are pretty straightforward on this first trial. I'm going to ask you to slap your left leg if it's an unpleasant word, your right leg if it's a pleasant word. You're going to see these words down the middle of the screen in a column all at once. So we can't self-pace this to yourself, time this to your own uh, pacing. You'll see a column of words down the middle. Your job is to take the first word and to slap appropriately, move to the second word to slap appropriately, and when you get to the bottom, to raise your hand. Because there are two other instructions I want you to follow as you do this, and they're pretty straightforward. Number one, I want you to do this as quickly as you humanly can. Because Keith is sitting over there with his phone out because he's timing you. So that's, that's the reason for the phone, I promise. Uh, he's timing you, and what he's going to do is he's going to stop his timer when most of you have your hands up in the air. But it's just as important that you continue to the bottom of the screen as quickly as you can because your own subjective personal experience is here just as important as what happens at the group level. And your second instruction is to get them all right. It's a 50-50 shot. You might get one wrong, and that's OK. Just fix it and go to the next one. None of this like, right, 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 I'm done. I mean, you've got to get it. Yeah, I know. You've got to get them correct. Okay? You have to how can you be right or wrong? Because these are consensus words, and your job is to identify, are they consensus pleasant or unpleasant words? It's going to be pretty. You're going to know if it's right or wrong. I, I promise. Uh, you will know. Um, and so that's your task, to do this as quickly as possible and to get them correct by, again, consensus pleasant, unpleasant words, or consensus black or, uh, or consensus white sounding names. OK, your hands. In your lap, left hand on left leg, right hand on right leg. As soon as you see this column of words appear on the screen, you're going to go from top to bottom and raise your hand when you're done. We're going to start in three, two, one, begin. We would round up to 17 seconds, a very reasonable, respectable time on a rainy Saturday afternoon. But uh, I believe you can do better. Um, OK, our next one. Our next task is, is the instructions are left side for a black sounding name, right side for a white sounding name. In three, two, one, begin. Fourteen points. Have fifteen seconds rounded up. That's a that's a new group record. Um, so what you've done now in the parlance of experimental behavioral sciences is you've done two experimental trials. Our third experimental trial is simply a combination of the two that preceded it. You now need to do both of these at once. We want you to slap your left side for an unpleasant sounding word or a black sounding name. Right side for a pleasant sounding word or a white sounding name. In three, two, one, begin. Sixteen and change. Very good scores. OK. So what we're now going to do is a new set of trials. So you saw this blue and green color scheme on the screen. We're going to change that color scheme just to sort of change the perceptual palette. Um, you're going to see yellow and red now. Um, some of the trials you're going to be asked to do are the same as ones you've done before. Some will be slightly different, but it's a new set of trials here. And so the first one I believe you've done before. Left side if an unpleasant sounding word. Right side if it's a pleasant sounding word. In three, two, one, go. Fourteen and change. OK. Um, this next task is one that is a reversal of what you were asked to do before. So now you're being asked to do your left side for a white sounding name, your right side for a black sounding name. In three, two, one, go. Go. 
14 and change as well. So we're in the 14 range in this trial set of trials. Okay, as we did before, the next trial is simply a combination of the two experimental trials that preceded it. So we're going to ask you to slap your left side for an unpleasant sounding word or a white uh, sounding name, your right side for a pleasant sounding word or a black sounding name in three, two, one, begin. Yeah, get them up there high when you're done, proudly. <laughs> so we're going to say 29, round it up to 30 seconds with what uh, in the behavioral sciences, again, we would refer to as a fair amount of attrition, uh, which means people who gave the hell up. Um, <laughs> so what uh, we are going to discuss, and we're going to get to a discussion of the science behind and the social and cultural meanings behind in a moment, but we're not going to get there quite yet. But what we are going to discuss is that when we had to put unpleasant sounding words and black sounding names on one side, pleasant and white sounding um, on the other side, that that took us about 15 to 16 seconds. It took us a Twice as long, to be, to be frank, twice as long to do it the other way, to put white and unpleasant on one side and pleasant and black on the other side. But before we can even get to a conversation of what that might or might not mean culturally, what that might or might not mean from a societal standpoint, what the science underlying that might be, I want you to do what we would do in my research methods class, which is put your very skeptical hat on and say, whoa, 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 hold up. There are some nuts and bolts procedural issues, questions I need to ask about and find out about and frankly complain about before we even get to that discussion. So let's do that by some, someone offer us an assessment of what they want to know or what they want to ask before we can even move on. Yes, in the back. Okay, so the question is, is might the order have played a role here, right? And, and, and correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but uh, it sounds like you, know, you, you sort of learned it one way, you did it one way, and then when you had to redo it and do it another way, it, it was harder. And I see a lot of head shaking. I see a lot of people nodding and agreeing. And I, me too, because when I do this task, I, I have the very same feeling. Um, let me uh, now explain to you why, even though that feels very much like what's going on, why it's actually not what's going on. And I have three explanations for you, but they, you got to wait a minute because they get increasingly more persuasive because the first one requires that you take my word for it and you met me like eight minutes ago. Um, and so the first one is that we have two versions of this uh, lecture on the, on the laptop. Uh, and in the other version of the lecture, this comes first and that is second. And when we do it that way, there's absolutely no difference in performance. This is still twice as hard as that. And the very first question that always arises is, well, I got to say, the first time I had to do two things at once, like put two things on one side, that was really hard. But I got better with practice. And it's the order, and we got better as we went on. It feels subjectively so much like order, because you're still sitting there and thinking, whatever, dude. If you had done this the other way around, it would not have happened that way. So I understand you're not going to take my word for it. The second response I would give you is when we did trial five, trial five was the first time you had to reverse anything. You had to put white and black, not on left and right, but on right and left. You had no, you sailed through that at 14 seconds. That was not a problem at all. You were very easy. It was easy for you to adapt to that scenario. It's only the last one. It's only when it's all together that it posed any sort of problem. But the most persuasive response I would give you is not my response. It's the response of the data. Has anyone in this room ever taken a test like this before online else? My guess is yes, a fair number of you. So what you were just asked to do is complete what's referred to as the implicit associations test. It's a test that was devised by researchers who are now at Harvard, Yale, University of Virginia, and University of Washington. And what these researchers created was this test, and you can take it online. In fact, you can take this test online for a variety of different dimensions and distinctions. We gave one based on pleasant, unpleasant, white and black names, but you can do it for other racial ethnic groups. You can do it for gender. You can do it for sexual orientation. You can do it for age, political affiliation, nation of origin, body type, and, and on down the line. Um, and there are now over 80 million people who have online taken the exact same test that we just took in this room. And when you take it online, the beautiful thing is you can counterbalance everything. So you can change the order around, and it turns out that it doesn't make a big difference. It's negligible. You can change around which appears on the left and which appears on the right first. So if you were thinking, well, I'm right-handed or I'm left-handed and I had trouble with, 
maybe at an individual level for, for individual trials, sure, but in an aggregate at the group level, it doesn't make a difference uh, in, in the long run. It's a negligible effect. If you were thinking the blue and green and the yellow and red are different color schemes and they had different psychological effects on me, I, I actually don't b believe that one because it only has an effect on us in that particular combination at the very end. And online, those colors don't, don't actually exist. So it is a terrific hypothesis. It's the hypothesis that everyone should have had, and I guess as many people did have uh, as we were going through it. And it turns out the data don't bear that out. So it's not order. Um, other questions or thoughts as to what they, people want to know about this before we can have a discussion about what it means, what, where it comes from, and so forth. Yes? Yeah, I mean, I have to say that, that I understand and I respect the perspective. I'm sort of skeptical of it. I mean, we look up here, and by my reading, that's white, white, black, white, white, black, white, white, black, white. It's actually a fairly straightforward pattern. If anything, it could be helpful. Uh, you know, we get over to here, uh, and we see, well, I'm go, oh my gosh, that's now we're, we're like at 8 AM. Uh, that was a good move. Um, while, while, while we fix our slides. Um, uh, and, and when you do it online, that, that order changes too, right? So I mean, in, in this particular instance, I can't rule out the possibility that a particular pattern may have been more or less. Um, yeah, just put me back there where I should have been and stayed. Uh, thank you. Um, but but you know, the idea here is that 80 million people have taken this in a variety of different orders. Um, he may have to toggle our yeah. slideshow. There you go. You figured it out. You're so smart. I thank know. you. <laughs> thank you. Um, this is why we do these together. Uh, um, and so online, again, that's all sort of counterbalanced. I mean, there are a lot of important questions that we also might want to ask. Sometimes people want to know, what if, what if you know, white and black as color names have certain implications, and people want to talk about that. Uh, if we had done this and it said Caucasian and African American, the results probably would have come out similarly. Uh, yes, you have a question. Great question. So a hugely important question. What if we look at the, the, the demographics of the people who are the respondents to this sample, right? Um, and that's an incredibly important question. And so when we look at that, you know, the, th this room looks much like many of the rooms where I teach at Tufts. It, it looks diverse, but, but still looks predominantly white. And that, that is the, the landscape in which we as faculty members at Tufts uh, operate. And so when we do something like this in our class with a predominantly white classroom, if we find that people are quicker to associate pleasant with white and unpleasant with black, could that simply reflect us versus them sort of preferences, that there's an in-group preference that anyone has, an out-group lack of preference that someone has, and that might be manifested in what's going on here. So if you do the same study, again, tens of millions of people have now done this online, and 75% of white respondents respond the way that, as a group, we did with this taking longer than this. If you do this same task with respondents that are predominantly or exclusively Asian American, so individuals who view themselves as neither the us versus them in this forced choice uh, dichotomy that I've forced uh, upon uh, race and ethnicity here, you find a very similar pattern of results to what you find with the white respondents. Suggesting, I think, when we have conversations in class, students usually offer the hypothesis, and I think it's reasonable, that, that a lot of what we're seeing here reflects cultural association and cultural learning. And if you grow up in the same society, and I know we all have slightly different experiences in our society, certainly, but if you grow up in our society, you're exposed to a lot of messages that make this harder to do than that. Or what about a group of respondents that is exclusively or predominantly African American? Um, the results there indicate that there's even more variability in response. About 50% of the respondents uh, show the same pattern we saw, with this being harder to do than the top, and 50% showing no preference or even a slight reversal. But it's not a mirror image of what you see with the white respondents. And again, when you give this test to individuals who are neither white nor black, uh, or in their, the way they identify, you see a pretty similar pattern of results, which suggests there's something ubiquitous and, and common and uh, out there in the culture, in the environment in which we live and grow up that helps us to understand what is actually going on here. We could have in a semester-long seminar a semester-long worth of discussion about this particular test. People want to know about the specific names that were used, and that's an important question. Though if you take this test online, it's actually not names. Anyone remember what it is? You don't see names. 
you see pictures of faces. And if we had done this with pictures of faces, the same results would have emerged. And so, again, we can have a long discussion about what this does and doesn't mean. Does it indicate that there's racism specifically endemic to this room or other rooms? That's not really the major focus of why we're doing this right now, that level of, of, of analysis, because that takes a long time. I'd like to leave you with these three conclusions as I turn things over to Keith. The three conclusions are the following based on this exercise. Uh, number one, See if I can avoid doing what I did before. Uh, this thing does not seem to, to like. No, let's go that way. Number one, um, associations like these are pervasive. So maybe you sailed right through these six trials at equal levels, and it didn't matter to you, and you were just as fast at the end as you were at the beginning. And that's very possible. But I guarantee you, if you give me enough of your time, enough PowerPoint slides, enough of your leg slapping stamina, we will find groups for which you and me all show these kinds of differences, these kinds of effects. These associations are pervasive. They are in society um, in very general uh, ways. Number two, they can be unconscious. They can persist even when we don't want them to. Again, my guess is that most people in this room would say things like, it's important to me to not be influenced or biased by these considerations, to, to view everyone equally. And, and that's great. And we should continue to feel that way and espouse those values. But that's not enough. right? That in and of itself does not get us out of this conversation, because a lot of this is unconscious. And number three, associations like these can influence our judgment and our behavior. I'm not saying all the time. You'll see the word can, so it's not inevitably, but they can. And they did here today in terms of how quickly we slapped one leg or the other. That might not seem profound. But there are other decisions that we make very quickly, whether it's screening a bunch of resumes, whether it's as a campus security officer or a police officer making a, a knee-jerk, split-second decision about whether someone belongs somewhere, is suspicious, poses a threat, and so forth. A lot of the decisions that we make on a regular basis are fast, are ones we don't have a lot of time to think about. And even when we do have a lot of time to think about, those kinds of decisions and ju judgments and behaviors can still be influenced by these kinds of factors. Keith is now going to tell us a little bit about why. Thank you, Sam. All right. So, ah, transition, I see. So the. <laughs> And obviously, I, we could have a lot of conversation, as Sam mentioned, about that particular task and the implications of that task. In the interest of time, we have to ask you to, to spend a little bit of time with a, a concept called suspension of disbelief. What we'd like you to do is to remember all those concerns and challenges that you have about that task and what it might mean. Keep them in mind, but leave, keep them in mind as we continue to explain some of the reasons why we think this might happen, why it might explain it. There will be a little opportunity afterward to talk a bit if you want to talk to us about some of those other kinds of challenges and questions. But for now, just take into account this possibility that these kinds of biases, as Sam sort of helped to demonstrate to us, are pretty widespread that we tend to have them a lot. We want to know why, what might be the case. And part of the reason why is because we're all human beings that rely, for the most part, on trying to deal with a complex world by taking some kinds of shortcuts. These are shortcuts or otherwise known as heuristics. Things that we do that maybe won't necessarily need us to take into account all the available information that is there, but we get just enough information in order to help us to make a decision in the moment that we need to do in terms of what we might need to do or what we might need to know. So we rely on these kinds of shortcuts all the time in terms of our thinking, and one of the shortcuts that we rely on is something called categorization. We use information about objects that are in the world, things that sort of jump out at us that are salient, and we use those salient characteristics to help us to decide what kinds of groups or categories that they might belong to. And then what we do is we recruit information about those groups and categories in order to help us to understand this brand new novel object that we haven't experienced before. So the idea is that that categorization process is something that people do. It's a normal human tendency. The ways in which we make judgments about the kinds of things like tables and chairs are ways in which we also make judgments about people. And just to give you a little excuse me, a little bit of a demonstration. I'm just going to ask you to um, go through a little task here. I'm going to ask you to look at the images that you see on the screen. As soon as you can tell me what they are, just say what it is. So say it aloud, real quickly. OK. What you might have noticed is, one, you were able to tell me what those were, and you tend to have a pretty common understanding of what they were. So table, couch, maybe sofa, or chair, maybe stool. The idea is that you use the same kind of idea or word in terms of determining what it was. What I'm suggesting you did is that you were able to look at some very basic characteristics of those images and use information about things that you've seen in the past that look like that in order to tell me what this particular instance was. 
The other thing you'll notice that you did is that you weren't necessarily waiting for the entire image to come into clarity. The idea is that they started a little pixelated, but once you got just enough information to tell what it was, you were able to tell me. You didn't have to wait to see the whole thing in its full resolution. That's a really important kind of concept because, again, what it suggests is that you used a shortcut. You used some salient cues about the general shape and structure to match it to something you've seen before and to report a name for that thing. Now, the idea is that this is a really useful thing because we can look at the surface characteristics of particular individuals or images and make some decisions about them and recruit information about how we're going to interact with that person or thing without necessarily seeing them in their full resolution. The idea is that that's a beneficial thing because it allows us to save time and resources and energy, but it's got a consequence. It often leads us to not necessarily consider individuals or other things in terms of their full and other kinds of um, non-visible characteristics. Another useful thing is that if you see something that you've never seen before, it's really helpful because what you do is you kind of match it. Maybe it's not exactly what you've seen, but you can match it and make some decision about how you interact with it, whether you're going to sit on it or whether you're going to eat off of it. So that idea that human beings have this process by which they categorize information and use that information to make judgments, it's really useful, it's beneficial, but it's a human characteristic. It's a human quality. And what we're arguing is that that human quality isn't just about tables and chairs, it's about other types of objects or people that you might see in the world. Real quick, I want to tell you about a little experiment done by um, Tajfel and Wilkes that was published in 1963 that tried to look at the extent to which these kinds of categories that we have might have implications for how we see these things, whether or not they might lead us to see them more veridically or whether or not there's some bias in terms of the ways in which we perceive them. And what these researchers did is they presented people with a series of lines. These lines sort of demonstrated or looked um, to be different lengths. So some lines were short, some lines were long, and they were presented in random order. In one condition, participants only saw these lines. In another condition, they saw these lines that were also associated with particular labels. So in this condition, you might see lines that show up, the exact same lines, but they might be labeled either the B lines or the A lines. So you have two different conditions in this study, some people who saw these lines alone and some people who saw these lines along with the labels. And the idea was to see to what extent seeing them under these two different conditions might influence people's memory for those lines. So what they found is that in the no labels condition, you saw that, um, again, the lines were presented to be pretty much similar, right? There were some shorter lines, there were some longer lines, and they were the same lines in the labels condition. And in terms of the results, they wanted to see the memory. And what they found is that people remembered those lines in very different ways. So people who were in the no labels condition tended to remember the lines to be pretty similar to the ways in which they were presented, in that you can see that there's some shorter and some longer lines, but pretty veridical in terms of how those lines are actually were presented. In the labels condition, they showed a little bit of a bias. And this bias in memory was consistent with this idea that lines that were categorized in the same group were seen as being a little bit more similar to one another than they were actually presented. And the exaggeration across the different groups, lines that belonged to different groups, were exaggerated in terms of distinction in terms of their length. So all the lines in the A condition were seen as shorter lines compared to all the lines in the B condition. And that difference between the conditions was exaggerated across them. What this result suggests is that people, when they use these kinds of categories, again, while they're very useful and beneficial in lots of different ways, they bias, to some extent, those things that we're seeing. They bias our memory to make us think that things that have the same category are much more similar to one another than they actually are, and things that belong to different categories are much more different from one another than they actually are. And if that sounds familiar to you, it is. It's the idea of stereotypes. The kinds of stereotypes that we have about particular groups, we think certain groups have some characteristics, different from other groups, and that we exaggerate those distinctions more so than they're actually there. So these characteristics or these, these studies are based on very, very sort of simplistic, non-interesting kinds of stimuli. You can imagine that lots of different things that are associated with people, with human beings, would exaggerate some of those differences. But what this is supposed to do, or at least this study demonstrates, is that there's a very basic cognitive foundation to the ways in which we think about people who belong to different groups. And that basic cognitive foundation gives us a little bit of a bias towards seeing those things in ways that are not consistent with how they might actually be. The implications of this is that categories can help to simplify the world in which we see, but they definitely bias the perceptions that we have about that world. And again, the extent to which there's thinking about these things as being consistent with the kinds of stereotypes that we might develop about people who belong to different groups, 
the ways in which we have these stereotypes can have another kind of biasing effect because they don't just bias the memories that we might have about people, they bias a number of different characteristics about what we do when we're making judgments about other people. They can influence the kinds of things that we see or notice. They can influence, again, memory. They can influence the kinds of things that we believe about other people. And they can influence the extent to which we act and react towards others. So what we're talking about here is a very basic sort of cognitive foundation for the ideas of stereotyping prejudice and discrimination that we experience in our society, which tells us, or at least suggests to us, that while there are lots of other reasons to start to think about bias as being something about good people and something about bad people, there's a basic cognitive foundation in all people that leads to at least some pressures in the directions that are consistent with stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time, Sam's gonna to talk to you about a, a study that's going to show some of the implications of this in one of the sort of more important real world contexts. It's actually working, you just have to close it off. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be very brief here. I'm going to give one example, as Keith suggested, of a way in which um, stereotypes have influence in a domain that's important to us, and then I'm going to turn things over to him to do the work of being our closer and wrapping things up and telling us where we go from here. So there are a lot of different examples that I could give you of studies that illustrate the effects that stereotypes can have on real-world domains. When we speak to professors, we often focus on the academic domain. When we've given talks to uh, the Tufts campus police, we've often focused on issues related to perception of threat and um, decisions about arresting and use of force and so forth. And again, a variety of different uh, examples that we could draw upon, we could do a whole semester on this. We're going to talk specifically about one domain that illustrates these concepts that ties to our initial or opening exercise, and I think that's a, a relevant experience for many people in this room. So, it's a study about resume evaluation that was done by Marianne Bertrand and Sendel Molyneuthan in 2004. By show of hands, uh, who in this room has as part of at least their somewhat regular day-to-day uh, -day operations the responsibilities of reviewing resumes? So a fair number of people here, and I know if I asked you to raise your hand if you ever sent your resume somewhere, we would get everyone to raise their hand, right? Uh, and so what Bertrand and Molyneuthan were interested in is the question of how some of the issues we're talking about here play themselves out when it comes to this process. Specifically, they published a paper called, Are Emily and Greg More Employable Than Lakeisha and Jamal? It's a pretty... Uh, illustrative title. You get what the study was about. In fact, the names they used in their study were the same names we used in our exercise to start things off. So it all comes full circle. What they did was they created a bunch of different resumes for jobs, actual job openings in administrative and, and, and staffing and sales types of positions. Uh, in I believe two cities was Boston, I believe Chicago was the other city. And they sent out thousands of resumes to actual job openings. And what they did was they created these resumes such that they could send out the same resume to two different jobs with just a different name at the top of the resume, right? And so they're sending out these resumes with, to, to these actual job openings to see what kind of response do they get. And the response you're hoping for when you send out a resume, of course, is just at its very initial level, do you get a callback? It's the very first, very low level, but, but outcome that you're hoping for when you send a resume. And so they're able in this study to look and to see how many resumes does it take for a particular resume person, a fictitious name that they're putting on a resume, how many resumes does it take to get a callback? And what they find is that for the resumes with the white sounding names, it took on an average 10. And for the resumes with black sounding names, it took on average 15. And if your response to hearing that is, oh, that's a difference. That's not a big difference, but that's a difference. No, 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 that's an enormous difference. That is 50% more resumes that it takes when you have a black sounding name just to get a callback than when you have a white sounding name. That is an enormous difference. If you think about all the obstacles that are in play when you're trying to get a new job and when you're trying to get attention to a resume and draw attention to yourself and separate yourself from that pile, that is an enormous effect. Um, in fact, what they're able to do in this study is show that having a white name on a resume was comparable in its influence to having an additional eight years of experience uh, on, a, on a basic resume across the board. That's very powerful and very concerning. It's very disturbing to see that, right? And You've got to believe that the vast majority of people who are screening these resumes and evaluating these resumes are people like us seated in this room, people who would say it's very important to me to not be biased. It's very important to me to pick the best person for the job, to go on objective criteria. But there are all sorts of cues we're picking up on when we evaluate resumes. Those of us who've done it know this, right? You look at the, you look at the font. You look at typos, right? You look at the organizational structure. Oh my god, this is a nightmare. I can't even read it. I'm going to the next one, 
Um, the formatting is too difficult for me. And apparently we look at the name and we draw inferences about the name, much as we do inferences about the university where they went to school, inferences about the companies they've worked in in the past, whether we want to admit it or not, just even from a general sense of feeling an affinity or a pleasant affect towards some names and not towards other names, it seems to have a difference here at the resume level. I think very simple study, very profound, and again, sobering set of results. And so I'm going to give Keith the unenviable task of telling us what we can do about this in like eight minutes uh, and, and wrapping up all this conversation. And of course, he's not going to be able to do that because none of us could do that. Uh, but to sort of highlight some of the considerations we need to keep in mind. If anyone can do it, it would be Keith Maddox. Um, it's true. But um, yeah, so he's going to walk us through some of that thought process. <laughs> That's great. Uh, thank you. Uh, no pressure. Yeah. This is fine. No, actually, I think um, I will try to do this in a way that maybe we can spend a little time having some question and answer afterwards. So um, the idea of what you can do about it, I think what we try to do with this presentation is, is just the beginning. It's a start. What we're trying to do is take this idea of these processes that are, they tend to be sort of under the surface or implicit or even sometimes people use the term unconscious to try to describe the ways in which we make judgments about people in the world. Things that have some influence that we may not necessarily know about. And what we're trying to do is make those things more explicit. The extent to which you have a better understanding of sort of how you might be influenced or biased by certain pieces of information about a person, understanding the foundation for why you might show that bias, and then the idea is that knowing that gives you an opportunity to potentially try to correct for that bias. This presentation really is about sort of hopefully opening our eyes about that particular process when it comes to this idea of implicit bias, kinds of implicit biases that we may have. But the terms of ways in which you can try to address it, the ways in which you can intervene, are really important because the idea is that if you now know that this is a potential source of bias and the kinds of judgments, then it gives you an opportunity to be able to do something about it. What we also would probably argue is that knowing what to do about it, we have lots of different ways to try to intervene, but understanding the nature of the processes that influence our judgments gives us much more information, powerful information, about specific ways in which we might intervene ways that might not be consistent with the things that we tend to think of as being generally effective. So from our perspective, one way of thinking about this is that people who are in these judgment contexts undergo lots of different kinds of aspects of their, um, of their work day, of their environment, that make stereotype use a little bit more likely. So it's more likely when the behavior that you're making a judgment about is ambiguous, when it's not quite sure if there's a right or wrong answer, oftentimes a stereotype will tip the scales in the direction of one versus another direction. Stereotypes are also more likely when judgments that you're making are subjective, when it's something that you have to make a decision about and that there's no real objective criterion about what might be right or what might be wrong. When you're mentally busy or distracted, the idea that the benefit of partly of using these kinds of stereotypes is that they save a little bit of cognitive energy. So this idea of taking a shortcut when you're busy or distracted, in those contexts, I'm sure all of us have experienced the idea of having an overload of information or of work that we need to do, of being distracted by other kinds of concerns that are going on in our life. And so any particular task at hand is going to be basically performed under these kinds of conditions. And again, stereotypes are more likely to tip the scales here. The other thing that happens is when you are feeling somewhat threatened or somewhat insecure. So this may be the case for people who are making judgments about individuals where they know that they're under some scrutiny by some superiors. This is also something that's very interesting when you're thinking about people who belong to underrepresented groups. The idea of threat or insecurity can also have an influence on them in terms of the use of stereotypes. And in this case, it's not necessarily how they make judgments about others, it's how their behavior actually, or how their performance is affected by these stereotypes as well. So this idea is that if we understand some of the conditions that increase the likelihood that stereotypes are going to be used, what we might do is we might start thinking about interventions that are going to lead us to address some of those conditions to try to make it less likely that stereotypes are going to be used. So to conclude, and again, I can't talk about those particular strategies, but those strategies would really depend on what you do, the kind of work that you do, your understanding of the constraints, whether or not those are more or less relevant for the types of tasks that you're interested in leading or developing interventions in, and then trying to develop interventions that target some of those possibilities. Um, to conclude, the idea of this presentation, hopefully, is to show us a slightly different perspective on the idea of bias. We tend to think about bias as being, if you will, um, thinking about that there's a barrel and that's full of apples, and some of those apples are bad, that there's some people out there who are bad, who are biased, who are prejudiced. That's not wrong, but it's not the only way to think about how bias acts and perpetuates in our society. 
Another way to think about it is that all of those apples have some potential to demonstrate bias under certain different types of conditions. And the idea is that if we try to understand what the source of that bias is, and we can understand the opportunities or the context that make that bias more or less likely to happen, then we're gonna be a lot more successful in dealing with the problem. And it turns out that the idea about bias is that it's not just the apples, it's something about the barrel, that task that you went through at the very beginning, trying to understand sort of the cultural associations with black and white names and whether or not they're positive or negative. That's something that we've learned as a function of growing up in a particular culture with real statistic, statistical, historical, economic, educational disparities amongst groups that lead to those kinds of evaluative difference, uh, differences. So the idea is that we've all basically used the same hardware to process the information that's out there in order to make some judgments about people who belong to different groups. That doesn't necessarily make you a bad person, but if you know about it and don't try to do something about it, maybe that does make you a bad person. <laughs> So what we're trying to do here is it's really a beginning, right? It's an opening step, it's an opening salvo, if you will, in this sort of war against bias. And the idea is what we'd like you to do is to kind of go back with this information, hopefully wanting more, wanting more information about what your organization might be interested in doing, potentially going back and trying to convince them that they should do something, take future and further steps to try to address some of these issues having to do with bias. We like to think that it's not so much about changing people's hearts and minds, it's possible that there are people who are not necessarily going to necessarily feel positively or negatively per towards particular groups, but the idea is that if we're not trying to change bias or the particular incidence of bias within individual people, what we might do is try to think about ways of interventions that try to address the context, like the situations, the situations like dizziness or distractedness that increase the likelihood of bias. And if we can intervene at a broader level of the environments, the situational or organizational climate that we might be involved in, then we think at that point we're gonna to start to have different ways of trying to address these broader issues of the um, of bias that doesn't necessarily target the hearts and minds of individuals, but still can have an impact in terms of the um, extent to which we can mitigate the expression or mitigate the impact of bias in terms of the organizational outcomes. So what we'd like to do is send you back with hopefully a little bit of information or knowledge that would help you to either support existing organizational efforts to address diversity or potentially inform those efforts by trying to get people to get more information to, to think about the strategies that they used and whether or not those strategies are based on evidence or if those strategies are just sort of generally based on lay ideas about what might be useful or beneficial to address this problem. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much to our presenters. So my understanding is we're um, gonna take a break now, but our presenters will be available on the mezzanine level outside uh, to take some questions from you guys during our break. So uh, just please be back here promptly at 11.30 for the next session. Thank you.